Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10th and final plenary session of the 8th Annual International Conference on Sustainable Development. I'm going to ask our moderator, uh, Phoebe Kunduri, professor at the School of Economics at the Athens University of Economics and Business, to connect her camera and microphone uh, so that we can start this session, the job opportunities, and the clean energy transition. Phoebe, over to you. Thank you so much, Sinead. Uh, I'm really happy to share this uh, last plenary of the day. Uh, we are, are going to be talking about job opportunities and clean energy transition. And we have representatives from the US, from Asia, and from Europe to uh, discuss this very issue. Because we all say that we want to become sustainable, we want to make the a transition to sustainability and this of course means transition to uh, carbon free energy but is it feasible with regards to the job losses that it entails does it create new jobs how many of them and how can we make sure that uh, the people in the workforce have the skills to respond to these new jobs. We have three amazing speakers in our panel, but I will first take a few minutes to set the scene with regards to the European case study, and then I will ask our amazing panel uh, to discuss further uh, their experiences from different continents. Let me share my screen and um, put um, the whole sustainability transition as uh, I understand it uh, taking place at least in Europe. Um, I'm going to try to bring together the SDGs, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and Agenda 2030, the European Green Deal, and the lately uh, enhanced EU multi-annual financial framework and the EU recovery plan. I always start my speeches these days uh, uh, presenting this uh, sketch with the three big tsunamis that we are facing currently, the COVID pandemic, the recession, the economic recession that comes, derives from the pandemic and of course climate change. And uh, we all know that uh, climate is an emergency and we need to try to limit it to uh, below uh, 1.5 uh, Celsius increase beyond which there is of extreme weather events and poverty for hundreds of millions of people will significantly increase. The European Commission with the, its European Green Deal has committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. This means that we need a global reduction target of at least 68% by 2030. A few days ago, the president of the European Pro Commission proposed to increase the 2030 ambition for reduction in emissions from 40% uh, to at least 55 percent. And this is a huge uh, uh, step forward uh, because, as we know, uh, very few countries are uh, able uh, at the moment uh, to implement um, SDG 13, which concerns climate action. And if you see the second map on my slides, the uh, situation does not look any more promising by 2030. So in 2015, we had the 17 uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. In a few months later, we have the signature of the Paris Agreement. And since then, um, United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, this uh, huge global network that tries to mobilize sustainability transition, is issuing the, its dashboard and index that shows the progress of of each and every country in the world with regards to the achievement of the SDGs. So not only does the 
uh, uh, SDGs give us our blueprint for the sustainability transition, but it also monitors our progress with regards to it. In 2018, IPCC tells us that we need to limit uh, the increase in temperature, not just by two degrees, but 1.5 degrees, which effectively implies zero net emissions by 2050. And in 2019, we have the six major transformations to achieve the SDGs, which are a very convenient way to operationalize the SDGs, mapping the way governments are organized um, a, in, in terms of implementing uh, the 17 SDGs. 17 is too big of a number for any uh, uh, government to handle. Implementation is much easier using these six transformation, education, health, energy decarbonization, sustainable management of land, water and ocean, sustainable cities and digital revolution for sustainable development. And it is interesting that the different transformation have different requirements and, um, uh, and specificities with regards to financing this transition. We might come back to this a bit later. December 2019, we have the European Green Deal. We know that this is about 2050 decarbonization. Um, uh, carbon neutral Europe by 2050, uh, clean tech leadership by Europe, and leaving no one behind in just transition, an inclusive transition. And of course, then we had the coronavirus, and we know the flattening the infection curve, steepened the microeconomic recession curve. And what was important um, here. Um, is to try to avoid uh, having the pandemic turn into a major economic and financial crisis that will long outlast the health crisis. And this meant keeping the workforce into place, channeling uh, financial support from the government to the vulnerable, safeguarding SMEs against bankruptcy, uh, support the financial system as non-performing loans mount, and develop uh, develop fiscal packages comparable to the crisis-related loss of the GDP, which of course will have to be financed by national debt. Many international and multilateral organizations have put together a recovery plan. The European Commission did the same, and we have our recovery plan, um, which um, to 750 billion uh, and enhances the 2127 um, multi-annual financial framework from, of the European Green Deal. What is interesting is that the, the money from the recovery plan have to be uh, 30% climate mainstream and also digital mainstream. So climate and digitalized climate adaptation and mitigation and digitalization are our major axis of um, um, allocating the recovery fund money. And based uh, on the need to bring all this together, we've at, at UNSDSN put together a senior working group for the energy transition, trying to identify pathways that will allow us to um, allocate the um, uh, recovery fund budget, the European Green Deal budget, and uh, of course, uh, the enhanced MFF budget according to the needs of each country. And uh, the needs of each country are identified by the technological and policy pathways that we are putting together for climate mitigation and adaptation across an EU member states. And these technological and policy pathways 
aimed to the joint implementation of the European Green Deal and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that are based on the European semester process country-specific recommendations, supported, of course, by the financial portfolios from the budget of the European Green Deal, the EU MFF, and the Recovery Plan. The, 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 this exercise is uh, developed for member states, uh, politicians and decision makers in order to facilitate identification and absorption of the funds at national level and create cross-country alliances for a sustainable recovery, but also facilitate public-private sector partnership uh, in order to mobilize private resources for the implementation of the European Green Deal. And at the end uh, of the day, create a climate pact manifesto between the policy makers, the politicians, the business, the financial sector and civil society in order to implement this transition. It is very important that the European Green Deal um, aspires to be financed uh, partly 50% by the uh, budget of the EU and the uh, income from ETS emission trade system, but the other half of the one trillion has to come from mobilizing private resources. In, in the days of a pandemic, when uh, uh, everything uh, needs to be uh, financed by public debt, it is uh, important for the public sector to come in to um, uh, achieve some, uh, uh, some uh, rebooting of the economy by big infrastructural projects and create a level of uh, certainty in the economy in order to attract the interest of the private sector to come in and invest. It, it, the pandemic has created such a big economic uncertainty that it is almost impossible to convince the private sector to come in. What we need now after so many crises, the financial crisis, the climate crisis, the COVID crisis, is a fundamental transformation of economic, social, and financial systems that will trigger exponential change in strengthening our social, economic, health, and environmental resilience. And we need big thinking and big changes. We need systems innovation. We need top-down mobilization like the climate loan uh, and, of course, our national energy climate plans, which is, uh, if you look at them uh, consistently and additively, it is obvious that the EU needs to raise to uh, climate ambition. And it is obvious that some countries need more incentivization towards um, embarking on a pathway uh, towards a, a, um, a climate neutral economy by 2050. But we also need bottom up mobilization, and here is where the climate pack of the European Commission is coming in, uses systems innovation approach and co-design with all the stakeholders of the future pathways. It is indeed important to realize that although global power demand will grow, we have on the supply side the renewables consistently cheaper than fossil fuels, energy storage installations increasing exponentially, strong energy efficiency improvements, large-scale carbon capture, and transition to circular economy. This means that we have a... a, a a mobilizing um, situation towards a green uh, recovery. And it is one argument that the energy sector needs to kickstart the green recovery after the pandemic. And this is what we are going to talk about in this uh, plenary. We need an ambitious agenda, incentive for job creation and climate change goals. And we need the public sector leadership on investing in clean energy. I'm, I'm wrapping up in uh, one minute. So it is very important to understand uh, 
uh, what is the relation between job space green recovery? What is the relation uh, between the jobs that are created during uh, a transition to a carbon neutral economy and the jobs that are lost due to uh, facing out fossil fuel? There are some uh, reports, the World Employment Social Outlook, that uh, indicates that the transition to a sustainable economy in the energy sector results in a creation of 24 million jobs globally, while only 6 million jobs will be lost, and we have a net increase of 18 million. According to this report, the net increase in Europe will be about 2 million. However, we have the world expert, which is our, our first speaker, that the net effect on jobs from a green recovery is much bigger. He's talking about 160 million jobs to be created globally and 4 million to be lost in fossil fuel industry. And he's also pointing uh, to the need to for investing in capacity building for the existing workforce into uh, in order to become able to respond to the new challenges of the new uh, sustainability transition so on this uh, uh, note i will stop uh, talking and i will bring in the a uh, true, uh, true expert on the subject, uh, Professor um, um, uh, Pauling, who has been working on this area for many years and has uh, produced extremely uh, interesting results. Professor Robert Pauling is a distinguished university professor of economics and coordinator of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts, Amster. Professor Pauling, please come in. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate. So I'm going to focus uh, primarily on the um, how we do the estimate. And thank you, Phoebe, for uh, mentioning the uh, article that I wrote uh, some months ago uh, with a much higher uh, rough estimate of the employment opportunities generated by a clean energy transformation than was uh, estimated in the ILO study that you were referring to. Okay, so uh, my first uh, slide, if you'll change it, uh, Elena, um, is what what you're looking at is just some estimates that I've done uh, over the past several years with co-workers, which shows um, the uh, difference differentiation in the job creation uh, through investing in a clean energy uh, infrastructure versus maintaining a fossil fuel energy infrastructure. And the first set of numbers, and I hope you can see them decently, uh, show us figures for uh, uh, six countries that all of which are fossil fuel producers right now, uh, major fossil fuel producers, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and the US. And if you can see, just uh, focus on the far right column uh, for a minute, what we observe in going from country to country is that investing in building a clean energy infrastructure generates about two to three times more jobs per dollar of expenditure in all the countries we've looked at. There is variation, as you'll see, uh, but uh, the clean energy uh, investments are job generators relative to investing in the fossil fuel economy. And then the second uh, set of numbers, the smaller three countries, uh, Germany, South Korea, and Spain, um, emphasize a critical, a related point is that for countries such as Germany, South Korea, and Spain, that are effectively 100% or close to 100% energy importers, that job creation, of course, is a total benefit. And so the transition from a energy infrastructure 
uh, existing in which you have to rely on imports to one in which you can generate uh, your energy primarily through domestic resources is a boon in a major uh, expansion of job opportunities. Okay, so let's switch the, the next slide. And uh, now I'm gonna focus on the methodological issues. So the question is, okay, you see my numbers in which we say we're gonna create two to three times more jobs per dollar or whatever your money unit is of expenditure. Um, how do I know that? And for that matter, Phoebe referred to my article um, in which I basically claimed that the net job creation was uh, you know, in the range of 160 million jobs as opposed to uh, 30 million jobs that the ILO came up with. Well, why should you believe me? Why do I think my numbers are any good? Okay, let me explain my methodology. Very straightforward. The, the basic tool is the input output tables, which are available uh, for all, almost all countries. A lot of regions, I do work with US states and we, we generate numbers for US states as well. And these uh, tables are based, the, the raw materials are based on enterprise surveys of how business operations work. In other words, you ask, entities, businesses, public sector enterprises. Um, what do you do when you walk into work every day or people aren't walking in now, but generally what what makes your enterprise go? You know, how much do you spend on labor and how much do you spend on everything else? In other words, buildings, machines, energy inputs, land. Okay, and that's basically how you construct an input output table. And you can go from relatively uh, low levels of specificity to very highly specified models such as those for the US, which uh, includes 546 activities in which we describe what goes on inside the enterprise. Now from those data, um, we're able to generate what we can call employment to output ratios. So we know what is getting produced in let's say a, a car manufacturer, a glass manufacturer, uh, retrofitting buildings, we know what the final product is, the output. And what we can also discern from the data are how much employment uh, takes place to produce a car window or to produce a, uh, a, a, a clean retrofitted building or to raise public transportation levels. So that's what we call an employment to output ratio. And uh, that the way that we uh, specify that, and in the table I showed you, the first table, it was the number of jobs that get created by spending $1 million. And of course we can change the units, money units, but it's basically the number of jobs created for a given amount of spending. Okay, so that's our basic measure, employment to output. And uh, what we can also observe within the input output tables are three categories, three channels through which jobs get created. And we call them direct jobs, indirect jobs, and induced jobs. The direct jobs are the jobs generated within the activity itself. So in other words, if we are retrofitting a building to make it more energy efficient, how many people show up at the building to put in the new windows, to put in the insulation, uh, to in improve the uh, caulking and the doors, if we're, if we're putting solar panels on uh, rooftops, how many people are required uh, and, and so forth. So that is the uh, di so-called direct jobs. Now, indirect jobs are the jobs along the supply chain. If we are uh, installing new windows in a building, um, who produced those uh, windows in the first place? And how did the windows get from the manufacturer to uh, the, the building that is putting in the new windows or to the car manufacturer. That's what we call indirect jobs. And those are the two main important categories of job creation that we measure. The third category is called induced jobs. And those are the standard multiplier effects that you learn about in intro to macroeconomics. In other words, when people are hired into the new direct jobs and the new indirect jobs, that means they're getting wages and they have money in their pockets, they spend the money and that their expenditures will in turn 
create these multiplier effects uh, that will create more jobs. And that's what we call the induced effects within uh, the input output model. So those are the three ways through which jobs get created. Okay, so now the next slide. Okay, um, yeah, okay. So uh, why do we get differences? Why would we get two to three times more jobs in the United States uh, uh, for uh, producing a clean energy uh, investment program versus maintaining the fossil fuel infrastructure. So there's three sources of these differences. And it's very straightforward once you think about it. One is what we call labor intensity. So in other words, if we're going to retrofit a building, or we're going to put solar panels on roofs, or we're going to build a solar uh, installation, uh, utility scale solar installation, how many people do you need to do the work? Okay, how many people do you need to do the work relative to how much you're going to spend on machines, buildings, land, and energy? And that's our standard measure of what we call labor intensity. The higher the percentage of labor inputs, labor intensity, the more jobs you get. Secondly, compensation. How much are you going to pay the workers? So if you pay a worker $100,000 uh, for uh, to perform a given task, um, you're going to have fewer jobs available than if you're paying people $50,000. So compensation is the second consideration. And the third, if we're thinking about job creation in a given country, would be domestic content. So if we're putting solar panels on roofs, how many, how much manufacturing is being done within, say, my country, the United States? Um, how much of the delivery is taking place within the United States and the installation versus if we are purchasing um, oil from Canada or Mexico or Saudi Arabia or Venezuela, uh, how much of all of that is being imported versus how much is being done domestically. And so those would be the three considerations and those will always be the three considerations and that's it. It's a very simple set of, of uh, variables here. Note, there is nothing about, quote, green jobs per se. It's about labor intensity, compensation, and domestic content. And once we can identify relative labor intensities, compensation levels, and domestic content, we know how many jobs you're going to get through a green investment activity, a clean energy investment activity, versus a fossil fuel activity. We don't have to define green jobs per se, as long as we can define the activities within the input output model. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, yes. So the finally, I wanna end with, uh, I, I've I expressed things in very simple terms and the basic framework is simple and it works, and I'd say it's robust. I've used it over and over again in many countries. Uh, people have, tried, have criticized it, and I think we've defended it quite well. But let me uh, complicate the story a little bit as, in terms of closing. First, when I say we're investing in clean energy, um, that's conceptually pretty straightforward. We wanna do things that'll get us to a net zero global economy. Um, but uh, specifically within the out input output model, there isn't a category that says clean energy. Uh, so we have to uh, construct that. We have to do it synthetically. We have to define what we mean and we have to assign relative weights to various activities. So I've given you examples like building retrofits or public transportation or solar energy or wind energy. Uh, and when we talk about solar energy, do we mean rooftop installations or do we mean utility scale? And so all of those things need to be specified within the input output model, each of those activities. And then we have to say, well, what proportion, if we're spending a trillion dollars, what proportion of the trillion dollars will go to solar? What proportion will go to wind? What proportion will go to building retrofits, electric vehicles, and so forth? That's the first big uh, thing that you need to work on. 
Uh, secondly, the input-output model is what we call a static model. It is a snapshot of the economy at a moment of, in time. And so we're looking, and it's, it's a very good snapshot. They're, they're reliable numbers because they're based on uh, pretty well uh, worked out industrial surveys. But that's the snapshot. And we're talking about a clean energy transition over the next decade to get to roughly a 50% emission reduction and a uh, net zero by 2050. So we have to incorporate changes over time. And how we do that is something that you know we can debate. Uh, you can do it in various ways, but we do have to take account of that because clearly labor productivity over time is going to improve. And that means that we will need fewer workers in 2045 than we need in 2020. And then the third and critical factor is, okay, we're talking about so far jobs, 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 numbers of jobs. But what about these jobs? Are they good jobs? And we talked I, briefly about compensation levels. Generally speaking, the compensation levels in the fossil fuel economy today are better than the job, than the compensation levels in the clean energy economy. So we want to talk about improving job quality. And then Phoebe mentioned, uh, we, what about, are people, are people ready to take these jobs? Are they well qualified? So we have to look at uh, the, the uh, workforce composition, whether people are trained uh, to get into these jobs. And to the extent they're not, we need to uh, improve it. And then finally, we need to look at who is getting these jobs. Generally speaking, these jobs are, uh, are performed right now by males, men. And in the United States, specifically uh, white males, overwhelmingly. And so we have to think about ways to expand access to make uh, these jobs equally available to all sectors of the society. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob, it's uh, very clear and a very useful methodology indeed. I am trying to uh, use it and not just your results, but the methodology as a whole for this uh, uh, project that we have on mapping the effects of the transition uh, to sustainability in, Euro in Europe and the implementation of the European Green Deal. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you handle the, for example, um, the future jobs that are not on table right now? For example, the European Commission announced that after 2030, they want to move towards a hydrogen uh, economy. How, how do you deal with that? I mean, how, how can you uh, incorporate in your analysis a future estimates of uh, uh, a hydrogen-based economy when we don't have enough information today for that? Well, we do have some information. So mm -hmm. uh, we do, you know, we can look at basically the uh, technical research, the literature on what, what is the production methods for undertaking hydrogen-based energy just like we would do for solar energy or wind energy or coal. Um, now, it's more speculative, of course. The fact that we don't have a mature industry means that the production methods are likely to change more rapidly, but we go with what we know, and then we specify within the input-output model what we know about uh, existing production methods. Yeah, obviously. And uh, I have uh, questions from the audience that are also very interesting, and I have the same question in my mind. Uh, obviously, uh, the um, transition to clean energy is one major is issue in the sustainability transition. But uh, the sustainability transition also concerns conserving ecosystem services, uh, concerns um, the transition to circular economy, which is uh, supposed to be a big part of the sustainability transition, cancelling out pollution and keeping uh, resources in constant use. So how do, do you deal holistically 
with these issues, not just decarbonization, but also the conservation aspect of the sustainability transition. Basically, it's the same technique. Um, and, and I actually have been modeling uh, issues around regenerative agriculture and uh, land conservation and reforestation. And, you know, the technical, again, uh, once we know what it takes to get people to do these jobs, and they are activities, and you can assign it within the input output model, you can get job creation. And of course, by the way, these active regenerative agriculture is hugely labor intensive. So if you want to create a lot of jobs quickly, uh, that's a much faster way than say, uh, some, most of the clean energy act, other activities. Yes, and uh, actually we try to uh, map ecosystem services using uh, of water, food, energy nexus using input output table in the way you propose in your methodology and I think it works and that's why I think your methodology is holistic and, and very, very, very useful. Uh, Rob, uh, thank you very much. I, in the interest of time, I need to move to our second speaker who comes uh, from Europe, uh, Dr. Mirko Armiento. Uh, he is a senior researcher at Enel Foundation and will give us uh, his experience on jobs, job creation and energy transition. Mirko? The yes. floor is here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. If you want to share your slides, please do. Yes, yes, I'm doing. Okay. Perfect. So thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me thank SDSM um, for, for this invitation, for inviting a foundation. And also today is a, is a great day because uh, we just announced a new partnership with the uh, SDSM for providing research activities, uh, in particular for the implementation of the European Green Deal by applying the six transformation you just mentioned before, Phoebe. And, but apart from that, today I'm here uh, to present the results of a study that we uh, undertook together with the uh, Euroelectric, uh, Cambridge Econometrics and uh, Guidehouse, uh, and we presented uh, this summer. Uh, the study is called Equality, Shaping uh, an Inclusive Energy Transition. And uh, the research question was, uh, how can, uh, uh, can we assess the effect of uh, decarbonization policies on, uh, on inequality in particular? Uh, we also uh, assess the effect on economy and on jobs, but uh, the main uh, uh, focus was inequality because it's uh, together with climate change, one of the the most crucial issues, I think, that we should address uh, nowadays, uh, together with COVID, probably, um, of course. But um, uh, so we basically uh, selected the six key um, decarbonization policies. Uh, this decarbonization policies, the, the decarbonization policy that aim that can allow us to uh, reach the target of the to achieve the target of the. 95% uh, uh, of CO2 reduction by 2050 in Europe. And uh, we see uh, what happens uh, in terms of uh, inequality uh, in the EU28. Uh, these results al also helped us to select some best practices and some case studies. And we also were, uh, was possible to, uh, to have uh, some uh, mitigation policies, some policy options that, uh, uh, if combined, can also uh, allow us to have uh, uh, an inclusive energy transition. So, um, just to go a bit more into detail, uh, here you can see in these slides, uh, these are the six uh, decarbonization policies that we uh, considered in our modeling uh, called E3ME, it's the Cambridge Econometrics modeling, uh, that it's also uh, used widely uh, by the European Commission. And basically uh, the, the, the scenario, the individual policy scenario are this, so carbon pricing, taxation on energy vector, the subsidies for uh, low carbon technologies, 
the phase out of fossil fuel support, the emission performance standards, and the measures to increase energy efficiency. As you can see from these graphs, which represent the gene index variation for each of these individual scenario uh, in, uh, in the year, uh, in the considered year, uh, you can see that some policies are regressive if taken individually, and some others are more progressive. It's the case, for instance, of carbon pricing or taxation. Uh, when, when we mean regressive, we mean that the effect, uh, I mean, the cost are, are bared by, uh, are bared by the, the, the lowest uh, income households, and then it would be, uh, I mean, uh, impact negatively on them. Uh, and progressive, we mean uh, the, the opposite. Uh, then, for instance, is the case of more progressive measures such as the energy efficiency measures or the subsidies for low carbon technology. But uh, uh, what's most important is that this was the starting point, but of course, uh, in order to achieve an objective, uh, you need to uh, implement all these policies together. You don't implement just one set of policies. And that's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, of course, when you implement a package, you have multiple effects, uh, overlapping on policies and effects, then the, the things is a bit more complicated. And uh, um, we will, uh, so basically with the uh, climate policies, if there is no policy action, you, so you don't act proactively, uh, uh, so um, there is no policy making, don't act proactively in advance, then you will have uh, regressive effects. Then uh, the, the population probably, and, and there will be no social acceptance. And we saw this already in Europe with the Gilets Jaunes movements and other movements that were opposing, not to climate change, but to the fact that they would pay much more than others. And, but it's possible to, to avoid that, as, as we will show you in a few, in a few moments. So uh, starting from that, we started to uh, select and investigate what were uh, the, the, the best, uh, let's say, case studies around the world and the best policies that uh, can act to mitigate this impact. And we find out that in Europe, for instance, since 90s in Sweden, there was uh, proposed uh, and implemented a reduction of VAT or taxes on electricity bills. And this uh, also helped to counter the regressive effects of specific environmental taxes then this can be an idea. Then uh, in Italy, uh, very recently, uh, the, the government implemented a targeted support scheme for energy efficiency uh, to obtain, it's possible to obtain 110% tax refund for investing in uh, energy efficiency measures and also uh, with no upfront costs for the lowest income households. Uh, in Scotland, there were uh, several successful uh, job retraining programs for people employed in the fossil fuel sector. But at the same time, mm, uh, it's not just Europe. In, in North America, um, uh, we have, for instance, in Canada, the lump sum transfer that were uh, introduced to offset the increased households' costs, uh, specifically coming from carbon pricing. And in California, we had the, the compensation fund. So these are all very best practices. And starting from this, we uh, consider the, the different criteria, among them simplicity, effectiveness specifically, and the deployability into the EU. We selected four key mitigating policy options that can help also to uh, balance much more the decarbonization policies that I mentioned at the beginning. Then uh, we selected the lump sum transfer. For instance, if we redistribute the revenues through uh, lump sum transfer, or at the same time, with the same amount of money, we lower VAT or taxes on electricity. This can really help a lot. Then uh, if we implement targeted energy efficiency measure, specifically with no upfront cost. Uh, if, of course, it's very important also uh, to have a, a proper and functioning job returning program to uh, tackle a bit unemployment in the most affected industry. But, um, at the same time, it's also important uh, funding subsidies for the most innovative low-carbon technologies, uh, for instance, via general taxation or using uh, as well the carbon revenues. So if we all um, consider, combine this policy option together with the, 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 the climate uh, policies, the six, uh, let's say, selected uh, climate policies, we see that the effort on, uh, on Gini index variation will be completely different. 
Uh, in the red area here in this graph, you can see that uh, if we uh, if there is no proactive, let's say, uh, policy making, uh, so with the simple standard revenue balancing or without revenue balancing, you will have regressive effect. Then it means that who will bear the cost? It will be the lowest income household. Uh, but if we implement this for uh, policy option, with I mean. Re recycling the revenues coming, for instance, for taxation on energy vector or carbon pricing, and you use lump sum transfer or uh, the other measure I, I mentioned just before, uh, then the effect will be uh, much progressive. As you can see, for instance, in 2040, we estimated that there will be less 1.5% of the gene index variation and this for gene index it's, it's, it's a lot let's say uh, we also um, introduced the sensitivity analysis in order to assess what would be the effect of covid and of course it will be a negative effect on the combined policy package but the effect won't be so large i mean it's in terms of 0.05 percent uh, the difference uh, so just to the last few slides uh, you, you, we also assess what would be the effect of this combined policy package on GDP and on employment. And as you can see from this graph, uh, our modeling say that uh, it would be positive. So I agree completely with Professor Paul in that energy transition will create a lot of jobs uh, and uh, also will, uh, will, uh, will uh, push uh, GDP. And uh, finally, this is my, my last slide, um, we'll have a progressive effect all over Europe. So uh, with the particularly, as you can see from this graph, uh, some areas such as Central and Eastern Europe or Southern Europe that are some, somehow most, uh, more peripheral in, in economy, they have more peripheral economies, can benefit the most from this, uh, from this uh, policy, policy making. Uh, options uh, implemented. So uh, we conclude saying that this is valid for Europe, of course, uh, but uh, I think can be um, can be uh, replicated a similar study for other uh, in other parts of the world. And uh, I guess the results can be very similar or at least comparable uh, in uh, in terms of uh, what are the takeaways. So for me, my the main takeaways of this study was that uh, if we act proactively. Uh, and if policy making uh, policies are implemented uh, in advance, then we can tackle uh, both the issues of uh, inequalities and climate change at the same time, and we can address it effectively. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting study. We definitely integrate it in the implementation and green project that we are doing uh, currently. Um, uh, and we are definitely working with the NL Foundation for that as well. So thank you very much for your clear presentation. I have an interesting question from the audience. I know it's um, uh, at the moment too much to ask, but I will uh, pose it to you. Uh, lately, we've been talking a lot about um, life satisfaction and happiness and uh, discussing that GDP is not an adequate measure of development and growth. And uh, the question is, is it uh, about time to integrate uh, um, life satisfaction, subjective well-being into the measurements of uh, job creation and the effects on employment? Well, uh, you asked the, the question to the right person because actually I, I wrote my PhD I thesis on, on alternative to GDPs and, uh, uh, well, I, I was a monetary indicator but not with subjective well-being, but I was very interesting in reading the literature. And I think, uh, yeah, the time is, is coming because, uh, I mean, uh, also after this last crisis, uh, global crisis that is affecting us with sort of the COVID, I think uh, uh, it's always more and more important. So, of course, I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, of uh, modifying GDP because uh, 
as a, or at least in uh, in finding alternative measure to compare GDP with. This is uh, this is very important because it can really uh, tell us uh, what uh, what can uh, I mean how how we are how uh, how uh, what is the level of uh, of the well-being of our society. So of course, uh, for me, these things, especially if related to the to the job satisfaction. Uh, and uh, with this big change that is, uh, I mean, uh, happening right now with smart working uh, and so on, I think this will be question good for thoughts for the future. Thank you very much, Mirko. I have to. It's there's never enough time. There's never enough time. Uh, I need to move to our last speaker. Uh, who is uh, Professor Yongshun Chon, President of the Korean Energy Economics Institute. We are very happy to have you with us. Uh, please, uh, Professor Chong, the floor is yours. B. Thank you, Professor PB. Uh, let me explain uh, characteristics and energy sector first. Korea energy sector is characterized by the dominance of fossil fuel, which account for 83% of total primary energy supply, strong dependence on energy import at 84% of total primary energy supply, and also dominance of industrial energy use at 55% of total final consumption in 2017. Korea government is committed to advance the country's energy transitions by increasing the share of renewable electricity to 20% in 2030 and 30 to 35% in 2040 to gradually phase out coal and nuclear from the energy mix while significantly improving energy efficiency. Under the Paris Agreement, Korea is committed to limit its greenhouse gas emissions to 536 million ton equivalent. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, as you can see the slide, uh, to reach the target, Korea must overcome the past, uh, past dependence problems. Reaching the ambitious target will require Korea to enhance decarbonization effort across all energy sectors, address regulatory and institutional barriers, introduce flexible market designs, make use of advanced technology and innovative capacity. Next slide, please. As you can see, we have a Corona-19 virus uh, crisis. So which impact? I would like talking about the impact of COVID-19 on Korean economies. Next slide, please. Thank you. COVID-19 has a negative impact on Korean economy, but its impact is small compared to other countries. According to the OECD economic survey, Korea is experiencing the lowest recession among OECD countries. The project contradictions in GDP this year is milder than other OECD countries. Next slide, please. This slide uh, shows the impact of COVID-19 on the total primary energy supply in Korea. The total primary energy supply is expected to fall by 1.4% to 299 million ton oil equivalent in this year from the previous years. As you can see, there are a big uh, decrease in oil and coal in 2019 and this year. Next slide, please. And also we have some impact on uh, final energy consumptions. The final energy consumption is also expected to fall by 1.3% to 
228 million TOE in this year from the previous years. As you can see, there is a big uh, decrease in oil and also transportations. Next slide, please. Thank you. COVID-19 and drop in oil price have different impact on energy industry by energy source. Decreasing demand for petroleum product, city gas, and electricity will reduce the sale of industries. Meanwhile, the impact of COVID-19 on the low carbon industry like as renewable energy efficiency are expected to be limited. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to explain the Korean New Deal, including uh, Korean deal briefly. Next slide, please. With regard to green economy, the government recognized the impact of climate change on the spread of disease, seeing how fast COVID-19 has been uh, transmitted throughout the world. New jobs are expected to increase along with demand for workers with new skill and technology. But there would also be jobs no longer needed and a falling demand for low skilled workers. The Korea government announced a Korean New Deal, including Green New Deal in July this year as part of its post COVID-19 recovery package, which is a significant step increase along the path of Korean energy transitions. Next slide, please. Thank you. The goal of Korean New Deal is transform the economy from fast follow to leader, from carbon dependent economy to green economy, with the society going to more inclusive one. There are two plus one policy digital new deal and green new deal and a stronger safety net which will be implemented with strong financial support and improved regulation to promote the private sector next slide please so as you can see uh, there are key projects by the uh, three different deals for example digital New Deal has three uh, key projects like as Data Dam, AI, Smart Healthcare. For uh, Green New Deal has also three different key projects such as green, new, uh, green Remodeling, Green Energy, and also the last one is Echo uh, Vehicles. Next slide, please. So actually, I don't have enough time, so I'm going to uh, briefly uh, explain about the uh, key project of Green New Deal. So as you can see, the, there are uh, eight uh, Green New Deal, uh, and also the government choose three uh, major projects out of eight Green New Deal projects. And also the government has investment plan. Uh, the government has planned to invest uh, 61 billion US dollar will be invested until 2025 and we estimate 60, 659,000 new jobs will be created and also we count which means 10.7 jobs per injection of 1 billion US dollar. Next slide please. I'm going to briefly uh, explain about the one by one for major project of Green New Deal. The first one is Green Remodeling. A total of 3.1 trillion won will be invested by 2022, creating uh, 78,000 uh, new jobs. And by 2025, a total of 5.4 trillion won will be invested. Also, we expected to creating 124,000 new jobs. So green remodeling has uh, different projects like as uh, public dental homes and daycare centers and recreation facility. So we try to uh, make more energy efficiency and also we try to construct new and also we do other things. 
Next slide, please. Oh, previous one, the en green energy one. Thank you. So the second uh, major project of Green New Deal is green energy. The total 4.5 trillion won will be invested by 2022, creating 16,000 new jobs. And by 2025, a total of 11.3 trillion won will be invested. We are also expecting a new job of 38,000. So green energy has uh, wind power, solar power, hydrogen economy, and also the green energy uh, support transition from fossil fuel generation to renewable energy generation. Next one, please. Next slide, please. The uh, last third one of major project of Green New Deal is eco-friendly vehicle. So as you can see, the Korean government has uh, planned to uh, increase the number of uh, electric car, hydrogen fuel cell car, and also we try to promote scrap, uh, scrapping of old diesel vehicle, including construction vehicle and farm um, machines. Also, we try to promote replacing with LNG vessel and use a diesel particulate filter for public vessels. Next one, please. So I'm gonna uh, briefly explain about the greenhouse gas emission target in Korea. So as you can see, the previously our target was uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 37% compared by uh, BAU but we uh, slightly changed the portion of domestic mitigation portion. As you can see, uh, we tried to reduce the portion of international offset. And last year, the end December, so we changed the uh, target like as uh, from relative target to absolute target. So right now the Korean greenhouse gas emission reduction target is 24% to 4% by 2030 compared to 2017 emission levels. Next one, please. This is my last slide. Uh, to get a uh, in target, uh, the government has many different uh, measures and uh, plans. For example, I would like to explain about the transportation the Korea government announced a revision to the standard for greenhouse gas emission from vehicle and mileage to that effect. From 2030, car will be required to emit 70 grams of greenhouse gas emission per kilometer, lower from current 97 grams per kilometer, and have better mileage 33 kilometers per liter of fuel longer than current uh, 24 kilometer per liter. So there are many uh, other measures and some plan and strategies. So uh, if we have some more uh, questions, please let me know. So actually this is my uh, presentation for the Korean uh, New Deal and also greenhouse gas emission uh, target. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very informative because it is not uh, some Europeans are very familiar with and we are excited to hear uh, about uh, green deals in Asia, in the US that are important and I say that as a response to one of the uh, questions which uh, says that it appears that uh, uh, green deals are localized uh, they are not. Uh, green deals are about uh, international trade and uh, cooperation and competitive advantage and uh, they, uh, they are focused on uh, uh, their success is uh, based on um, uh, um, international trade, efficient international trade. Um, so it seems to me uh, that uh, the Korean Green Deal is consistent with what is going on in the U.S. and in, in, in Europe. 
uh, uh, you are focusing on uh, decarbonization, on circular economy, mobility, energy efficiency. Is circular economy part of the picture? And in order to devise your Green Deal, do you uh, take, uh, um, as an example, maybe the European Green Deal that uh, was the one uh, that, that was the first one on table? Uh, how did you use the, ex the European experience in what you've uh, put together? Professor Pibi, uh, that is a very important question and very good comment. But as you may know, our Korean Green Deal announced this July. So that means it only have two months. So we are still studying and working on uh, how can we uh, make Korean New Deal to success. And also our uh, goal is we try to transform our society to low carbon society. So we're studying about uh, or benchmarking to uh, European New Deal and also the, I understand the USA case also they uh, thinking about the uh, American style of New Deal. So we make a benchmarking and compare together and then each country has their own uh, characteristic of New Deal. So we try to make successful and sustainable to our society to low carbon. So please wait more and uh, we will study and then uh, uh, sharing about our of information. Course. Of course. Thank you so much. It is so important that each and every continent, each and every country have their green deals so that they are no um, uh, uh, border issues with regards to imports and exports, with regards to importing uh, fossil fuel, high content uh, imports and exporting low fossil fuel content so it, it what is important is to have a global climate pack and this is what president macron is trying to put together so that everybody all stakeholders in each and every state really uh, commit to their signature in the sustainable development uh, goals and agenda 2030 which has been signed by 193 uh, states and it's our um, global agenda so uh, thank uh, thank you to a big thanks to all uh, three speakers uh, the methodological um, introduction by Rob, uh, the um, uh, nice uh, European uh, project, uh, European analysis by Micro, and uh, you, um, Yonsan, uh, bringing together the Asian experience has been very, very interesting and very promising for the global transition. What I want to re-emphasize is that in this transition, we uh, need to make sure that we uh, keep everybody involved. It has to be a just transition. We can leave no one behind. And I think the biggest challenge is not to become greener. The biggest challenge is to be able to provide capacity building for our workforce in order to keep uh, synchronize in order to synchronize with the incredible incredible pace of technological advancements i am worried that this fourth industrial revolution will be a huge challenge on our workforce and our um, and the way we are going to try to handle the synchronization of our education and capacity building and skill provision with the advancements in technology will be one major uh, future challenge. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. Bye.